All right, so that's our, those are some preliminary stuff. Let's get into lecture two, which is basics of neural networks. This is really for those of you who haven't trained neural networks before. Uh, for those who have, who have trained neural nets, this will offer some insights. What are the efficiency aspect about um, how to, re, uh, what is the measurement, the key measurement of the efficiency metrics of deep neural nets? So a uh, very quick summary from the previous lecture. We mentioned uh, deep learning is everywhere in vision, in language, in speech. And the performance for deep learning um, is uh, improving very rapidly in recent, recent years. The accuracy on ImageNet is dropping dramatically uh, in, the last, uh, in the past 10 years. Also for text translation, remember last time we did a live demo with one of our TAs, with Eugene. Uh, working on this live demo, uh, we hope to push uh, such applications to mobile without having to connect the internet. We also talk about efficient deep learning for autonomous driving, okay, how to avoid having a whole trunk of workstation, right? And also have a more efficient processing of um, those um, auto, uh, 3D uh, vision applications. Also, we talk about deep learning for, for games, like each game is taking almost 2,000 CPUs okay, and almost 300 GPUs, $3,000 per game. And also the um, alpha fold is taking like 16 TPU V3s okay, for a few weeks. So in this lecture, uh, we will first review uh, the terminologies of neural nets. So what is the neurons, synapses, activation, uh, features, weight, parameter. And then review popular building blocks in a, a neural net, including fully connected layer, convolution layer, grouped convolution, uh, depth wise convolution. We also talk about pooling layers, uh, normaliz normalization layers, and also the transformers. Next, we will review those convolutional neural nets architecture, including AlexNet VGG ResNet 50 and MobileNet V2. Next, we'll introduce those popular efficiency metrics. So what is considered a small, compact, and low-cost neural networks, including the number of parameters, the model size, the peak activation size, the max, the flop, and flops. Okay? And lastly, our TA Zhijian will give a live tutorial on PyTorch for those who haven't, haven't played PyTorch before and then um, do a live demo on lab exercise and show how do we submit labs in the future. So in particular, get you familiarized with our lab infrastructure so that in the future, we will try to help you make it easier to submit lab one, two, or three, all the way through lab four, okay? All right, um, let's get started. So first, last lecture, we briefly discussed about neurons and synapses, okay? so. A synapse uh, have many input axons, and then a, uh, we multiply the weights of the input axons and, and combine them together. We have an activation function. If the accumulated value is greater than uh, this value, then we are going to, uh, ex uh, going to uh, output a, a signal at the output axon. Okay? So this is an example of a three-layer neural networks with two hidden layers. So the terminology is synapses, weights, parameters, meaning um, those trained weights. Okay? And neurons, features, activations, so we use these terms um, to mean the same thing. Okay? Basically, neurons, features, activations, we mean the same thing. And also for synapses, weights, and parameters, they are the same thing. Uh, so let's start by introducing these fully connected layers, also called linear layers. Okay, so the output neuron is connected to all the input neurons in this case. Okay? And we want to dive deeper into what are the dimensions for each kind of neural net architecture. Okay? So this is very critical for learning efficient neural networks, since we are going to deal with what is the size of the activation, what is the size of the memory footprint, what is the number of computations we have to perform. Okay? So dealing with dimension is super important. So all these lectures after this, we will figure out what are the dimensions for the input features, output features, the weights, and the bias. Okay? So let's start this journey together. Let's look at a, a simple uh, uh, 
linear layer with a one-dimensional input. Okay? So the number of channels uh, we denoted as CI. So here we have uh, five input channels. Okay? And then we pass it through a weight matrix. Okay? So we have input dimension of five, output dimension of, of three. So we have CO of three. O means output, I means input. Okay? So this is a, um, uh, the W can uh, basically turns a five dimension input into a three dimension output. So in this case, uh, when we have a batch size of n, so we just have more rows and more rows in the output as well. So the input feature dimension is basically n times ci, right? And the output feature is basically n times co. And the weight dimension is ci times co. Okay? And the bias is, in, uh, uh, is equal to the number of output, output dim, uh, dimension, which is co. So this is the basic architecture and how to calculate the dimension of a multi-layer perception. So let's now look at a uh, slightly uh, more complicated scenario to talk about 1D convolution, one-dimensional convolution. So rather than just having a uh, just one uh, channel, one channel, right? So here we have multiple uh, dimensions in the spatial, spatial dimension. There are many signals that are similar to this case. For example, the uh, speech signal. Okay? So for speech recognition, uh, we have a pretty long temporal uh, sequence. Okay? As you speak, um, this is a t uh, this time dimension. Uh, this could also be, uh, the, for example, your uh, monitoring the state of a machine, whether there is malfunctioning on the machine, which is a very popular tiny ML uh, application. You have this temporal dimension for the uh, voltage, for the, for the uh, current, etc. Okay? This is also very popular. For example, you want to decide what you are doing in your Apple Watch. Okay? You have the temporal dimension, and you have, the, for example, the accel uh, accelerometer data from x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, gyroscope, etc. So this is the channel dimension. At each timestamp, you have multiple different components, voltage, current, right? Uh, it could also be a uh, temperature, each one could be forming a one channel, and this is the spatial or temporal dimension, okay, T1, T2, T3, T4, okay, so those, this is why uh, one, uh, one D convolution is very important. So the, um, the, the one dimensional convolution is basically computed by performing the multiplication of each element and sum, sum them up together and to produce one output, uh, output element. And you have multiple such filters which can produce another dimension in the same, uh, another channel in the same dimension. Okay, so you have uh, the, 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 yellow, um, uh, the yellow filter which produces this yellow output, and then you have another filter in green to produce this green output, etc. You, you can have multiple such filters to produce multiple outputs. In order to produce the next uh, spatial dimension, we can uh, shift the input, uh, shift it by one, so that we can produce uh, the next spatial output, and shift it by another step to produce the next um, um, spatial value. Okay, so this is the input, this is the output. Um, therefore, we can calculate the input feature dimension, which is n, which is the batch size, and then the ci times the um, the WI, okay? CI is the channel and WI is the width of your uh, input signal, okay? Imagine I put more features in my speech, so this is going to get longer. If I have a longer sequence of, of speech to process, this dimension is going to get longer, okay? Hopefully such uh, example will give you some intuitions, not just understand the math, but also what is the intuition underneath the math. All right, let's continue to move to a slightly more complicated scenario, 2D convolution, which is widely used in processing your images. Okay? So now we not only have one dimension, we can have the other spatial dimension. So input image, you have both the X dimension and also the Y dimension. So this is a X dimension, Y dimension. You also have this channel dimension, right? So usually an input image contains three channels, the R, G, B, okay, red, green, and blue. 
Okay, so here you can have R, G, B, maybe some other, maybe also that, maybe other, some other channels as input. Okay. And then um, the activation map, so in order to produce the output, we again, we pass it through a filter. Okay. The dimension of the filter is denoted by the K, which is uh, indicating kernel size, kernel size of the width and kernel size of the height. And then the C dimension is a channel. Okay? The channel should be exactly the same as the input okay? so that we can uh, exactly do um, element-wise, uh, do the dot product with this filter uh, together with uh, part of the uh, input image. Okay? So in this filter, we have a three by three uh, kernel size, and then we have five channels, okay? which we are going to do a dot product with this input region, which is again three by three times uh, five. Okay. So after such dot product, we produce one output element. Okay, just one output element. So how many modifications do we need to produce such a single element in this case? Since we're talking about efficiency and hardware efficiency, this is a critical metric. How many computations, how many modifications we're going to do? Okay, we're going to introduce that the detailed concept very later, but now I'll just give you some uh, intuition. What is the number of modifications you have to do in order to can calculate a single output element? CI times KH times KW. Yeah, exactly. Good. So CI times KH times K K KW is the number of modifications you have to apply to this region and then sum them up together to calculate this uh, single output. And then if you want to have multiple output channels, we are going to have multiple filters. The yellow filter produces the yellow output, uh, the blue, blue filter produces this blue output. And then we are going to move the input in the spatial dimension okay, to calculate uh, the other spatial dimension of the output. Okay? So we are going to uh, shift it and then shift it in the other dimension. And finally, we get the entire output tensor. Okay? The output tensor is again three-dimensional. Okay? Although it's input image, uh, intuitively it's 2D, but actually it is 3D because we have this channel, uh, channel dimension. Okay? So in this scenario, the output is three by three and the channel dimension is three because we have one, two, three kernels in this case. So let's see what is the dimension for the input feature in this case. So we have N, which is the uh, batch you have 10 images, then n equals to 8, that equals to 10. Okay? And then we have this ci dimension, which is uh, this uh, input channel, and h and w. Uh, for output feature, uh, n is the same, the batch is the same, so the channel can change. In this case, uh, the ten output channel is only 3 rather than uh, 5 in this case. Um, and then the h and w becomes 3. And then the uh, size of the, of the weight equal to um, CO, which is the number of kernels, okay? and the CI, which is equal to the input channel, and also the KH and KW, which is three by three in this case. So how do we calculate the output dimension according to the input? Okay, what, is, uh, a, what is the output of the height and width? Okay, so basically that is equal to the um, h of the input um, minus the kernel size, which is three in this case, plus one. Okay, so uh, in our example, uh, we have the um, hi equal to the uh, the input height equal to three, okay, and the kernel uh, equal to four. Okay, one two uh, one. Sorry, uh, here the input. Uh, in this example, not this one, in this example, the input is four, okay? And the kernel size is three, okay? And then therefore the output equal to the four minus three plus one, uh, which is equal to, which is equal to two in this case. So far so good for this convolution example. Yeah. Green, orange, blue, okay. Oh, you mean uh, why blue? We put uh, green in the last dimension. 
Oh, the sequence is actually, uh, sorry, the figure might be misleading. We can change that later. Uh, the sequence of uh, uh, green, uh, orange, blue should be the same as uh, green, orange, blue. Hmm. Okay, so we can find a problem here where actually the feature map from the input and output is actually becoming smaller in this case. Um, how do, uh, for example, if our um, GPU kernel is optimized for by a 256 by 256 uh, input convolution. After doing one convolution, that becomes like 250, uh, maybe 250, uh, 254 by 254. And then the kernel might not be optimized. So how do we keep the same resolution across uh, different layers? And the idea is to use the padding. Okay? So we pad the output so that we can have the same size of the output as the input. Uh, there are several approaches to do the padding. Um, the simplest one is actually uh, to do zero padding. So this is your output. You just pad the remaining positions with zero. Another, uh, so let's calculate what is the uh, equation uh, for the output versus the input. Actually, the output equal to the height of the input plus two times the padding size and then uh, minus the kernel size in plus one. So for example, in this case, the input uh, height and width is both five, and the output is actually, uh, the kernel size is actually three. So the output size will be uh, five uh, plus two times, uh, two times one, uh, minus three plus one is again five, okay? So in this case, we can uh, pad those elements to make sure the output and the input have exactly the same dimension. We can also do uh, other padding methods like reflection padding. Uh, for example, here we reflect the two, so we get five, okay, and then we get eight. Similarly, in this direction, we get ref five reflected with six, and then four reflected with six again. Uh, we can also do replication padding. Okay? So for example, we just replicate whatever element is the closest to, to this previous element and replicate uh, pad uh, this feature map. So let's introduce another important concept, which is the receptive field. Okay, so uh, we want to have a global uh, understanding of the whole image to understand what is the high-level features. Okay, so we want to have an output a pixel to be aware of uh, what is happening uh, for a pretty larger area of the input okay? to extract those higher-level features. So in this example, when we are having uh, three layers, okay, so what is the receptive field? Uh, what is the size of this receptive field? So how many inputs all the way to the left can impact the output of this location? So here is actually seven, right? So uh, since we have three by three convolution, uh, all these regions will impact the output of this pixel. Okay? So for these two corners, all these regions will impact that. And all the way propagate back to the input, we have uh, three by three pixels that will impact the output uh, pixel. So um, the problem is that in order to have a large receptive field, um, we need many layers for each output to see the whole image. In this example, we need uh, three layers in order to see a region of seven by seven. Okay. So how do we uh, ensure we can have fewer number of layers, but we can still see a large receptive field? And the idea is to do down sampling inside the neural net. So this is the equation. What is the relationship between the output height and input height with respect to uh, the stride? Okay, so in this, uh, in this example, we can have a strided convolution layer to increase the receptive field. Um, in this example, again, we have one, two, three layers, okay? but we are having a strided convolution. Therefore, the uh, receptive field becomes much larger in this case. So on the bottom is our original example where we have a stride equal to one. And on the top, we are having 
a new a new example where strat equal to equal to two. Okay. So um, when we are having only two layers and kernel size equal to three, um, the receptive field is already seven. Okay. Rather than uh, previously we need three layers to have a receptive field of seven. And this uh, animation illustrates what is the strategy convolution where we are not shifting by one, but now every position we are shifting by, by two. So previously here, next one, rather than move it by one pixel, we are moving actually by two pixels. So that's what strategy convolution means. Okay, so um, let's introduce another method to reduce the amount of um, amount of weights. Okay, so previously uh, the number of weights in the convolution layer equal to uh, the multiplication of these four terms: C I C O H W uh, K H W, uh, sorry K H and K W. Okay, so uh, we can introduce this group convolution to reduce the number of parameters. So uh, previously each output channel is related, has to be uh, calculated for uh, each input channel. So for group convolution, um, we have, in this example, we have two groups. For the second group, it's only depend, dependent on the second group of the input channel rather than the entire uh, input channels. Okay? So for example, these four outputs, it's only dependent on these four input channels rather than all, all together these eight input channels. Okay? So what is the impact of the number of weights. So we have two, two separate convolutions, but each one is g times smaller. Okay? Each one is two times smaller, but we have two of them. Okay? Therefore, overall, if we have two groups, the total number of weights, here you have g multiplied together, we have g two times smaller. If you have uh, four groups, the number of weights will be four times smaller. So again, you have more convolutions, but each convolution is um, uh, g times smaller in the input, g times smaller in the output. Okay? So all together, you are uh, you're having a g times smaller number of weights. So that's grouped convolution layer. So on many mobile devices, um, in 2000, roughly in 2016, 17, uh, uh, another uh, convolution layer is proposed, which is called the depth-wise convolution layer, especially for those uh, mobile vision. If you're interested in deploying neural nets on mobile phones, um, with uh, this uh, this convolution layer will be very popular. Okay? So again, rather than multiplying these four terms together, um, depth-wise convolution, you only have three terms. So um, with, that is an extreme case for grouped convolution. In previous example, um, the number of groups is equal to two. But in this example for depth-wise convolution, the number of groups is equal to the number of channels. Okay? So the number of groups is eight in this case, since we have only eight channels. Therefore, each output channel is dependent on only uh, one input channel. So this greatly simplifies the convolution, uh, the size of the uh, convolution weights, and also the number of operations. So now we have, how many weights do we have? We have um, kernel size, like three by three, and then how many such filters do we have? Uh, we only have C such filters. It's no longer uh, CO times CI, but it's just uh, C times Y. Okay, we just have C times KH times KW number of filters, uh, number of weights. Okay, so any questions on group convolution or depth wise convolution? For group convolution, how do you choose which one to use? Uh, so you choose it, you group it by, uh, say you have two groups, then the first four and then later four. You have four groups, then you evenly divide it by uh, first a quarter and the next quarter and the next quarter and the next quarter. For um, simplicity, usually people divide them consecutively. The channels interact with each other. So 
for these two groups, they don't interact with, it, with each other. So um, for, for the first group, within the group, they interact with each other. Among different groups, they don't interact with each other. Okay. Uh, of course, that will uh, be the balance between the amount of computation versus the latency versus the accuracy. You can imagine you can have more such layers, but each layer may have less computation to compensate. Or you can have more channels. So we will talk about definitely talk about the uh, trade-off. Okay, so um, let's talk about the the next concepts, which we have more uh, different fancy uh, fancier operations. So including the um, dilated convolution, uh, transpose the convolution, and um, and stridid transpose the convolution. Uh, so Julian, this is muted. Are they, is that expected? Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, dilated convolution basically, rather than having all the inputs consecutive with each other, uh, you have more receptive field in a dilated convolution. And transpose convolution is widely used in back propagation for training. It is also widely used for uh, pixel-wise predictions when we are doing uh, segmentation or, or uh, super resolution, okay? which is the inverse of the uh, input convolution. So for more information, feel free to check out the website to see the, uh, the math ex uh, expression. Okay, so next uh, let's introduce the pooling layer. Okay, when we are want, well, we want to downsample the feature map to a smaller size to reduce the convolution, uh, to reduce the amount of computation. So in a convolution neural net, um, usually um, as you get deeper and deeper, you have more and more number of channels. And you can imagine if we have the same uh, resolution like 256 by 256, the computation will uh, keep increasing. So uh, we want to gradually reduce the size of the feature map by this pooling operation. So uh, this is a four by four input. So after pooling, that becomes two by two, okay? Um, so this is using um, max pooling. What is a max pooling? So pick the max for the for the this entire region. So for this uh, blue part, we'll pick uh, the, the pixel five. But for this one, we'll pick seven. So that becomes the uh, output. Or we can do average pooling. Just calculate the mean for this region and for uh, the other regions. Okay. So the pooling operation is usually um, Channel independent, okay, it's very local, and there is no learnable parameters. Okay, you just find the max or find the mean, which is relatively simple. Another important layer that is evolving roughly uh, emerged roughly during two, four, two, uh, two, uh, 2016 is this normalization layer. Uh, this is pretty new. When I just started my PhD, there's this is not quite popular yet, but this is quite an important layer uh, recently getting very popular, which is this normalization layer. Okay. So people find that normalizing the features can make training faster. Okay. So what is normalization? We just pick a region where we want to uh, normalize. We calculate the mean of the pixels in this region. And we also want to calculate the variance uh, within this region. And then uh, we want to uh, subtract the mean and divide it by the uh, variance. Okay? Um, and then um, we learn a per channel linear transformation. Okay? We have two learnable parameters um, for each channel at the scale and also uh, the shift. Okay? And then we are going to um, transform the input feature map by um, uh, multiplying that with a, a scale at first and then add this, add this bias in a per channel manner. And there are several popular uh, normalization dimensions. The most popular is probably the uh, batch normalization. Okay? So in this paper, group normalization summarizes a lot of normalization methods. So in batch normalization, we are going to, call, uh, we are going to set um, this, um, this set to be in the n dimension, which is the batch dimension, as well as this h and w dimension. Um, and in this, this is the layer normalization, which we are going to select from the C dimension as well as this HW dimension. 
And recently, there's another form of layer normalization that only uh, um, normalize using this C dimension. So for each channel, for each pixel, we are going to normalize that, especially for many uh, transformer applications, including NLP application and vision transformers. Before calculating the attention, we want to make sure uh, each token, the feature of each token is normalized. Okay? So uh, recently, uh, layer norm also have a variance use only not normalizing across the C dimension. We also have this instance normalization, which only uh, normalize across um, a single uh, channel dimension across the whole H and W. Or we can have a uh, group normalization, which is in between this uh, a general uh, method for this instance normalization, which normalize partially across uh, this channel dimension. Okay? So different normalizations just use different definitions of this set highlighted in blue. Um, so uh, in efficient neural networks, some of the normalization layers can be folded into uh, convolution layers to save the computation. Okay? So the more number of layers you have, uh, the more data movement that occurs. Okay? So you have to use uh, these normalization layers wisely. Sometimes we find uh, these, these normalization layers can improve the, uh, the training convergence, but sometimes it makes inference um, more challenging. Since only this batch normalization can be folded into the convolution layer, not all the, uh, but not all the normalization layers can be folded. And sometimes um, it hurts the, 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 the efficiency of a neural net. Okay, so uh, let's now uh, introduce the activation functions. Uh, question here. Well, on the previous slide, the, the definition of energy movement In the previous slide, yeah, in the top right. the epsilon is a very small number to make sure that the square you, is doesn't. Uh, you don't want to divide by zero, yeah, right. so we want to make sure there is a very small number to prevent you from dividing by zero. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Oh, sorry for the YouTube you uh, readers, where the space actually means mute, not proceeding with the slide. So when you're watching the video. On, on YouTube, this might be some issue just now. But it's a good lesson. Okay, so uh, we have um, several popular uh, activation functions. Sigmoid function, uh, which is basically one over one plus e to the power of minus x. ReLU is the most popular and most efficient um, activation functions, uh, which is basically if the input is below zero, um, the output is zero. If the output input is above zero, then uh, it is linear. Okay, so um, and also, the value is probably the most efficient uh, implement uh, from the implementation from the implementation perspective, since um, it doesn't require complicated arithmetic to uh, to calculate the uh, the output. Okay? And it's very quantization friendly if we can cap it. Uh, we can uh, threshold the output uh, to be uh, some number, maybe six. So value six is also a very popular activation function and why we want to cap it this make make it possible to have a fixed range between zero to six which make it easier to do quantization and what is quantization we are going to introduce in, introduce that in the in second lab okay um, so what is the problem for red so if the input is below zero the gradient is all zero okay so that makes uh, the back propagation uh, impossible so we uh, so people introduce this leaky ReLU where we have a small, relatively small slope when the input is below zero, so that the gradient is not bad in this manner. So uh, recently, um, people introduced two fancier activation functions um, through neural architecture search, which we will talk about that later. People find this switch function can help boosting the accuracy. So the switch function. Uh, you have gradient everywhere, rather than like red, uh, the, the, the neuron will be bad if it is, uh, if it is negative. But it's very similar uh, to, to red, but uh, it has gradient everywhere. However, imagine is it, this might not be that friendly to actually implementing hardware, right? So this has, doesn't require any computation, but this requires computation. 
and in some platforms like um, Snappy, uh, like in, uh, Android, some Android phones, this activation function is not efficiently implemented. So be careful when you are trying to use uh, these more fancier um, activation functions. Or the last one, which is the hard switch function, is an approximation of uh, this switch uh, for this switch function. Okay, so it is using a more um, hardware friendly implementation uh, with the similar uh, form of, of your of your activation. But if x is smaller than minus three, then it's zero. X greater than three, then it's just x. And in between, um, this x times x plus three uh, divided by six. Okay, so it's easier to implement than switch, but be careful. This, uh, these activation functions might not be quantization friendly. Okay? If you want to quantize it to 8-bit, uh, uh, this is the easiest to use. Okay? Um, these ones, if you're using a P32 on a GPU, so um, these ones is okay. okay. But for quantized mobile deployment, uh, try to avoid using these activation functions and try to use value and value 6. But maybe that's a research question. Maybe someday people can propose new ideas how to make us, uh, uh, people how, can pro propose how to make switch or hard switch easier to contest. Uh, is the signal function also easy to implement? So is it hard to implement, but easy to contest? I don't know. Um, so you, you can see the range is between 0 to 1. So the, the, the range of the activation is small. It's not hard to quantize. So, but is it also easy to implement? Uh, really yeah, that's why uh, Redo and Redo 6, if you see the modern neural networks, most of them are using these tools. And performance-wise, Sigma it doesn't show significant improvement over Redo. But certain points, like in transformers in softmax, sometimes Sigma it is very necessary. Hmm. Okay, so lastly, we want to talk about transformers, which is getting super popular in recent years uh, for not only natural language processing, but also for uh, vision applications recently. Now, we are going to dive deeper into uh, the transformers. In, uh, we have a dedicated lecture just talk about efficient transformers. But today, let's introduce some basics. So a transformer has two parts. We have, a uh, we have an encoder, and also we have a decoder. Uh, for the encoder, we have two parts. One is the multi-head attention, followed by the uh, feed-forward uh, network, FFN. And for the multi-head attention, this is basically what it, what it does. So we have three inputs, the value, uh, the key, and the query. Okay? Um, so we are going to pass uh, the, the QKV. Uh, each of them pass it through a linear transformation. Okay, And then we do the uh, attention uh, mechanism. So what is this popular attention mechanism? Um, basically, try to find the relationship between each token, okay? The relationship between each token. So if you have n tokens, you will have an n by n um, dimensional, uh, dimension of uh, attention map, okay? You want to find the relationship between each token. So that's why you have n by n uh, dimension. So we calculate this attention by uh, QK transpose uh, this through this matrix modification. And then uh, we scale it uh, by the dimension and multiplied by the uh, use that to, to, to multiply with the value. Okay? So basically that gives you the output of the uh, uh, of the attention. Okay? Um, so there is usually a soft max layer uh, after this um, calculating this attention map. Okay? So what is the problem for the attention layer? Imagine if you have a pretty large uh, pretty large uh, long token sequence. If n is pretty large, the attention map is n squared. Uh, the complexity grow um, uh, quadratically with uh, the sequence length, which is a potential issue. And we are going to talk about how to solve that issue later part of this lecture. Okay, so having talked about that, let's introduce several popular scene architectures. So let's start with AlexNet. So AlexNet has five convolution layers and three uh, fully connected layers. So here we are calculating the uh, dimension of the height and width. Okay? So um, we are using this uh, equation we just uh, learned in the previous uh, earlier part of this lecture. So 
the output height equal to the input height times two times uh, two, uh, two times the padding size and minus the stride uh, minus the kernel size and divided by the stride. Okay, um, you don't have to remember such equation. It's very easy to refer them from the internet. But roughly, after each stage with a stride of two, you have a resolution roughly half of the previous stage. Okay, initially you have two twenty four by two twenty four, and after the uh, first convolution where you have a stride of four, okay, you have one quarter of the input resolution from two, uh, 224 to 255. And after another, uh, uh, after the, uh, uh, the max pooling layer, okay, so you are dividing the, uh, the input by another uh, two times. So you don't have to exactly remember what, whether this is 26 or 27 in, in practice, but roughly after, um, after the stride, Stride the convolution, you are going to have get a smaller resolution. Uh, after a uh, pooling layer, you are going to get get a, a smaller uh, resolution. So, what is the remaining uh, dimensions? So we can use similar equation to calculate that. So here you don't have any stride, you don't have any uh, pooling, so the resolution keeps the same. And for the last one, you have a six by six. Okay, so this is the VGG uh, network, which has 16 layers. Um, each layer contains the convolution, batch normalization, and the redwood layer. And next, we, uh, we, we have this ResNet 50, which is very, very popular in recent years. So ResNet basically introduced this residual branch so that we can make the gradient flow easier and enable uh, deeper neural nets. So uh, for between this residual branch, we have three layers uh, for ResN50. Um, we have a one by one convolution, and then followed by a three by three, followed by a one by one convolution. Um, for the one by one convolution, it smartly reduces the channel size by four okay, before this three by three convolution. Why is that like that? Because the three by three convolution is much more expensive. You have nine elements rather than just one element per channel. Okay. So you want to first squeeze, reduce the number of channels, and then expand the number of channels. So the computation is, uh, is relatively small. Okay. So um, what about for this um, residual branch, what about for those uh, areas where the input resolution and re output resolution is different? So we have a stride tool, one by one convolution to match the input resolution versus the output resolution so that they can be uh, element-wise added together. Okay. So that's why we color them into two different colors. For this light green color, um, those are corresponding to the input resolution, output, output resolution are the same. So that you can directly have this bypass residual branch and then followed by this element-wise add operation. Uh, for those um, layers where the output resolution is smaller than the input, okay, with this stride, stride two convolution, okay, for this stride two convolution, we have to use uh, another uh, down sample layer uh, to uh, make sure the, the, the dimension matches. For many mobile applications, we have this mobile uh, mobile architecture where we introduce uh, this stepwise convolution, okay. For depth-wise convolution, we are basically expanding the channel by six and use this depth-wise convolution in the middle and then followed by another one-by-one -one convolution. So for, uh, for those down sample layers, we just don't have this residual branch. Okay, so let's now introduce uh, different efficiency metrics, how to uh, measure the efficiency of different neural nets. So ideally, for a neural net, we want it to be smaller, faster, and also greener, right? For smaller, we want to uh, ship it to Apple Store easier. For faster, when you're driving on the road, you want an autonomous driving car to be responsive. Okay? And for greener, we want to make sure our battery lasts longer. So that concerns three aspects when you are designing neural nets. Storage, how many uh, storage do you need to store the weights of a neural net? And what is the latency? How fast can you process um, the input from the input to the output? And energy consumption. And that concerns two factors of a neural net, the computation and the memory. 
Okay? The memory also is offered different from storage. Okay? Storage is a static concept, only the weights and the code, but for memory that also inc includes the activations. So we are going to cover the efficiency metrics from two perspectives. One is the memory related, the other is computation related. So for memory-related, we are going to talk about number of parameters, the model size, uh, the total activation and peak activation. For the computation-related, we are going to talk about max and flop. Okay. So how to calculate the latency? Okay, so we load the weight, we load, uh, we load the input, we load the weight, we can compute it, and we store the output. Okay. And sometimes we hope to uh, overlap the data movement versus the computation. So the latency is roughly um, the max between the computation and the T memory, if we have enough hardware resource to parallelize in space. Okay. So the T, computa uh, the T computation is basically the number of operations in a neural net divided by the number of operations the processor can process per second. Okay. So the uh, denominator is basically the hardware specification. And the nominator is basically an N specification. And the T memory also have two components. You have to move the activations. You have to also to move the weights. Okay? So the time to move the weights is basically equal to uh, the model size divided by your memory bandwidth. So that's why smaller neural nets um, is better. And that's not only the uh, that's not the only term. We have another term which is the data movement of the activations, okay? So that equal to roughly the input activation size plus the output activation size divided by the memory bandwidth of the processor. Okay? This is really the first order approximation of the amount of data movement. In, re in reality, it, it could be actually larger if you don't have enough, enough locality, okay? Or if some of the weights can be fully stored in SRAM, you don't even have to move them from the main memory. So this is really, just the first order approximation. Okay, so now we want to introduce an important concept between the, uh, the cost of different operations. So um, we want to introduce an important concept where memory movement is much more expensive than computation. Okay? So uh, this table uh, summarized the energy cost for different operations. Okay? So for computation, uh, no matter if it's add or multiplication, or access a register file, it's just a couple of picojoules. But access a 32-bit uh, DRAM memory can take as much as uh, 640, um, 640 picojoules, which is uh, 200 times more expensive than uh, multiplication and add. Okay? So we want to try to reduce the amount of data movement when we are designing neural nets. And also, it is this data movement that is quickly draining, draining our memory. So you want to encourage a neural network to have more computation, but very uh, limited amount of data movement. So let's put them together. Um, this is the three aspects of efficiency metrics with storage, latency, and energy. And then we are going to start by uh, introducing the number of parameters. So parameters is basically uh, the number of weights uh, for a given neural network. So for a linear layer, uh, that's very simple, just input channel times the output channel. For a convolution layer, we just calculated that. We have the number of input channels, number of output channels times the kernel size. Okay. For grouped convolution, we are basically, if we have two groups, then we have two times less number of, number of weights. And for depth-wise convolution, um, that's when the G is equal to the number of channels, so the uh, uh, number of weights is just uh, multiplying the uh, K and C together. So here is the calculation of the number of uh, parameters for AlexNet. So the first layer, um, when we are having um, the kernel size is 11 by 11, we have three input channels, 96 output channels, I multiply them together, we have 24K parameters. This is the second layer, five by five kernel, uh, 96 input channel, 256 output channel. Since we have a group of two, so we divide it by two, okay? two uh, 300 roughly, 300K uh, parameters. And then feel free to calculate the remaining number of um, parameters um, on yourself. 
And then let's talk about model size. Okay, so the number of the model size is basically equal to the number of parameters times the bit width per parameter. Okay, we can either use 32 bit floating point or we can use a half precision 16 bits, we can use 8 bits. So that uh, that impacts the model size. Okay. Say if AlexNet has 61 million parameters, if the weights are stored in 32 bit numbers, how many, uh, what is the total storage needed to store this model? So each uh, 30, uh, 32 bit is equal to four bytes. Okay, so we uh, we need altogether 224 megabytes to store uh, this uh, this uh, this neural net. What if we quantize them to eight bit numbers? So eight bit is one byte. So we need one byte for each parameter. So totally we need 61 megabytes. Okay. So in later part of this lecture, we are going to teach the techniques to quantize from 32 bit to eight bit for the models. Okay, so let's then talk about the uh, total activation versus the peak activation. Okay. So number of activation is the um, memory bottleneck for inference for IoT applications. So uh, for example, from ResNet to MobileNet V2 0.75, they have the same image net accuracy. The number of parameters reduced by 4.6 times, but the activation actually increased for the peak activation, which is the largest for the uh, input plus output for a certain layer. So the size of activation is very important. And also we are showing the distribution of the activation is highly imbalanced. Some of the blocks, some of the layers can have a dominating um, activation so that what is the least amount of memory to process this neural net? That is impacted by the, by the peak, okay? Not the average, not the sum, but the peak, okay, for inference. And for training, that's impacted by the sum. For the, uh, for the for inference that's impacted by the peak. And why activation matters? For training, the activation is actually the memory bottleneck, not the number of parameters. So in this slide, we are showing the um, comparing the parameters versus the activations of Resident 50 and also the mobile IV2 1.4. Okay. So for mobile net, um, it has four times less number of parameters, but the activation is only improved by 10%. Okay? So activation is really a less studied area, and also it is the dominating factor for training, because here we have to store all the input activations for back propagation, and also we have a larger batch size, not single batch size, uh, compared, with uh, compared with inference. Um, so this, in this figure, we want to give you an idea what is the distribution for the weights and activations for a, 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 for a neural net. This is MCU net, which is quite representative for these tiny ML applications. Uh, the yellow part is the uh, activation, and the blue part is the weight. So the X axis is the uh, layer ID from the first layer all the way to the last layer. And we can find that the activation is actually pretty large in the first couple of layers and gradually getting smaller. While the, um, the weight is getting larger and larger in later layers. And why is that the case? Actually, this is a fully convolutional neural net. There's no fully connected layer. Yeah, you have a lot more channels in the uh, later layers, and you have a pretty large resolution in the first couple of input uh, the input activation uh, the activations, right? So I, I, as you go go to later stage, um, you have a smaller resolution. Okay, the, so the activation is getting so smaller, but you have more channels. So the weight is getting larger. So here we want to show the uh, activation for. Uh, for AlexNet, okay, so how to calculate them? Just multiply the C, H, W together. The total number of activations, we can calculate also the peak number of activation, which is the number of input activation uh, plus the number of output activation and find the max across different layers. And in, uh, in, in this example, it turned out to be the first um, 
layer, okay? So the sum of these two layers is actually the largest. All right, so the last metric, which is the number of max, okay? So uh, how to calculate the number of computation required to process this neural net? So we are going to introduce max, which is the number of multiply and accumulate, uh, accumulate operations. So each multiply and accumulate operation is basically A equal to A plus B times B times C. Okay, so we are multiplying B and C and accumulate that on A. Uh, so let's see, what is the number of max for matrix vector multiplication? Okay, so that's basically I, M times N. Uh, since we need to produce M outputs, in order to calculate each input, we have to do n operations, okay? So the number of max for matrix vector multiplication is mn. What about matrix matrix multiplication? The first matrix m by k, the second one is k by n, and get a result of m by n. So uh, we have to uh, produce how many outputs? So it's m times n. And how many max do we need for each element? So for each element, we need to produce, uh, we need to pro perform k operations. Okay? So altogether, it's m n times k. Okay? So this gives you an idea how to calculate the number of max. So let's see what is the max required for different layers. For linear layer, that's just a matrix multiplication. Uh, that's just uh, c in times uh, c out. And what about the convolution layer? So how many outputs do we need to calculate? So that's WO, HO, and CO. How many operations do we need to calculate each pixel? Just now we uh, have that question. So to calculate each pixel, we need to calculate uh, this three by three times the input channel, this amount of operations. So all together, how many terms do we need to multiply together? Six terms, okay? Three for the output and three for each element. So that's why we have multiply all of them together. Okay, we have uh, this amount of outputs. For each output, we have to do this amount of work for each pixel. What about for group convolution? Okay, so we are just having, uh, uh, we have two groups, then we have twice, uh, we have half the, uh, the computation. And for uh, depth-wise com uh, convolution, where the number of groups equal to the number of input channels, so uh, the number of Total, total, uh, amount of uh, total amount of computation will be five terms multiplied together. Okay, so let's see the number of max for uh, AlexNet. We are multiplying these six terms together. Um, the output dimension is basically uh, uh, 55 by 55 by 96. To calculate each output, we need three by 11 by 11. So we are multiplying these six terms together. And for the second layer and the remaining layers, we can calculate in a similar way, basically multiplying these six terms together. So all together, we have 726 million operations in total. All right, so the last concept, which is flops. Okay, so flop is, uh, indicates the number of floating point operations. So a multiply is a floating point operation if the, both operands are, are floating point numbers. And an add is also a floating point operation if the both operands are uh, floating point uh, numbers. So one MAC is actually two flops. Okay? So if AlexNet has 724 million MACs, then what is the total number of floating point operations? So it's just multiplying the, that by two. Okay, we get 1.6 gigaflop. And what is floating point operation per second? So that's indicated by flops. Okay? This big letter S means per second. So how many flops you can process per second, um, which indicates the performance of the hardware. So finally, let's review what is the model size for modern uh, AI. It's growing very rapidly, like GPT-3 is already 170 billion parameters. And this NVIDIA Megatron language model requires 512 V100 GPUs to process. It has 8.3 billion parameters. 
And this is showing the number of max. And why we prefer max over flop? Because if you quantize the neural network for inference, it's no longer flo floating point operation. So max is more accurate, no matter if you're using uh, IP uh, IP32 or, or IP16 or even int8. So this is the number of max required to, uh, to achieve a certain amount of accuracy for these popular neural nets. And the size of the circle basically indicates what is the number of parameters. And how do we make, uh, make it more efficient? So we want to make sure we will have smaller amount of computations and high accuracy. All right, so in summary, uh, in this lecture, before uh, Zhijian is going to dive, dive into the uh, PyTorch tutorial, uh, we learned, reviewed the first basics of neural nets, the neurons, the activations, the synapses, the weights, and the popular layers, including the FC layers, convolution layers, stepwise convolution, group convolution, pooling, normalization, and reviewed several classic neural nets. And then we introduced um, these efficiency metrics including the memory related and also the computational related. And don't forget about these dimensions to calculate what is the number of max and what is the model size uh, for different kinds of layers. For the remaining uh, uh, 25 minutes, Zhijian will give a tutorial on PyTorch and also to give an idea how to, um, how to prepare for our labs. So let's welcome Zhijian to give a, uh, the tutorial.